Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane. I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library and I can't even tell you how thrilled I am to be here with author, screenwriter, man about town, Lee Goldberg. He's going to tell us all about that man about town thing, but we are celebrating a book birthday for him for this book called Calico, which is probably backwards for you, but we, if you have some cake, knock yourself out. And before we get to my introduction, though, of Lee, I wanted to just say a couple things. One is I'd like to thank the uh, friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. I'd also like to thank Lee because he let us um, partner with other libraries in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to bring this program together. And when um, libraries work together, you know, we just make magic. So um, I feel like he is a wizard. <laughs> thank you. Um, you can buy signed books from Lee from Aesop's Fable. I will put the link up for that in the chat. And of course, you can get them from your local libraries because, you know, magic. You know, I don't have to say that again, right? Um, so Lee Goldberg is, like I said, an amazing writer, script writer, book writer. Um, he has done all kinds of things like Hallmark movies and he writes mysteries and he teaches and um, he's just incredible. And I think we're going to have this amazing conversation about his mysteries, his his screenwriting and his collaborations. Please put your questions in the q and I will be, this is just a Q&A, so I will be asking your questions while I ask mine. So Lee, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. I had to come a long way to attend this. I had to walk all the way from my kitchen up here to my office. I'm exhausted, so forgive me if I look a little travel lag from the long journey. <laughs> I know, the smog just probably got really got to you. And I don't know if I can live up to the introduction. I'm amazing. I'm a wizard. I'm a man about town. Oy vey. <laughs> yes, I have those, all those uh, superlatives written down somewhere. But tell us about yourself a little bit and then Calico. Well, first, you need to know I am a television writer producer which means I'm totally insincere and you can't believe a word I'm saying. Um, I come from a media family. My father was a television anchor man when I was growing up. That means he was on the news every night. And he talked like this all the time with the same insincere smile I have on my face right now. And my mom was a feature editor for the local newspaper. So writing and television didn't seem out of reach for me. And I've been writing as long as I can remember. My first book was published when I was 18 years old. It was called 357 Vigilante. And in fact, the cover for one of those Vigilante books is behind whoop, behind my shoulder there, uh, up on the wall, back when they used to paint covers uh, instead of using uh, computer graphics. And uh, my new book is called Calico, and it's sort of a departure for me. I, I think I'm pretty much known these days for writing police procedurals, and it is a police procedural, but it's also a period Western. And what they share in common is the same dead body. I know that sounds weird, but trust me, it works. Well, at least I think it works, and most critics do. There are a couple that don't, but, uh, you know, what do they know? <laughs> well, you've already told me before we started that it's been getting incredible reviews, except for one. Yes, yes. <laughs> there was one that called it profoundly dissatisfying, devoid of inventiveness and memorable characters. It also said that I'm old, fat, and smell bad. But I didn't take any of that personally. No, they didn't say the last part. All the other reviews have been fantastic. You know, I, I, I read them aloud at the dinner table, the good reviews. Good, okay. Actually, yeah. I learned, in all seriousness, I learned a long time ago not to believe the great reviews or the bad reviews. You start believing the great ones and you start getting really full of yourself. Though my wife will always puncture that balloon pretty quick. <laughs> As wives are meant to do. Um, so I do want to talk about Calico a little bit, just because I know that um, we we talked before about not giving any spoilers, but I really do want to know why, what made you decide to go in this other direction in terms of your writing? Because you're very popular. So why mix it up? Well, I like to keep fresh. I don't want to do the same thing all the time. But this does, it is very much a Lee Goldberg book. It still has a mystery. It still has a propulsive plot. There's still a lot of humor. And it is still a police procedural. But I've also always wanted to write a Western. And, and I had to ask myself, what can I bring to the genre that nobody else has done? How can I honor the tropes and serve the tropes, but also completely subvert them? And by combining it with a modern day police procedural, I found a way in, a, a way 
to do it and, and to create a, a modern day contrast. So we're looking at the past with contemporary eyes and seeing it as it really was, not the sanitized Westerns we, we see in movies and TV and actually read in books. I mean, all these Western heroes with clean clothes that looked like they were perfectly pressed and, and with perfect teeth and great hair. I mean, the, the truth is the West was a stinky, awful, horrible place with feces and urine all over the ground. There was no sanitation. People had terrible teeth, god-awful skin, filthy hair, terrible clothes. You, you don't see that. And, and you know, what passed for medical care was just barbaric. So I bring that reality. And not everyone was a perfect shot. You know, not, not everyone is a, a, a gunfighter. And I, and I paired that with what I typically do, a, a, a police procedural that isn't just about procedure, but has a, at least I hope, an interesting and unusual protagonist at the center of it and an intriguing mystery. And I set it in a place that I had never seen a police procedural before, procedural before, which is smack in the middle of the Mojave Desert, a desolate wasteland. What is law enforcement like out there? Hell, what was it like surviving out there in the old West, a place that's inhospitable to life in general? And I think that that makes both the police procedural and the Western aspect fresh. And then, of course, integrating them. I don't think anyone's done that before. And maybe after this book, won't we'll ever do it again. I don't know. <laughs> I'm guessing a lot of people will do it because it, I felt like it was very successful. Like I think I told you I didn't finish the whole book, but I thought it was, the interweaving was so good. You know, just the right pacing and timing for that, I thought was amazing. You're never supposed to admit you didn't finish the book. Oh, sorry. Never, so, I, I kept trying to finish it, Lee, but I kept nodding off or, or getting sick <laughs> to my stomach. You, know, you don't want to admit that. You want to say I was so compelled that that the rest of my life was meaningless. All that mattered to me was finishing your book. I couldn't get out of my head. It was like literary crack. If it's not true, that's what you want to say to stroke the fragile eagles, egos, excuse me, not eagles, <laughs> egos of guys like me. Okay, well, um, I'm a librarian fail, I admit it, but I did stay up very, very late last night and I just, I was like, okay, I have to go to work tomorrow. But I did really love every part of it I read. I don't know if that strokes your ego, but there you go. <laughs> My ego is stroked. Excellent. Then my work here is done. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say, like, um, even though this was new for you, I felt like you had done it a million times before. Good. I want you. To, I don't want you to see the work that went into a book. I want you to just enjoy it. I want you to be transported. I want you to escape your troubles in library hell or wherever you happen to work. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your problems in life are, I want my books to take you away from it. My books... Are not selling a message. I'm not making a political point or 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 anything else. I am just trying to, to give you a good time, make it a lot of fun. And I don't want to call attention to my writing either. Mm -hmm. If 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 you suddenly realize you're reading a book, then I've failed. I want you to get so into my stories that the words disappear and you're just sucked into a time and place and an adventure. Mm -hmm. And if I have something clever to say, I try to put it in a character's mouth and not in the description or in uh, you know, the, the prose, the setting up of the situation. Mm -hmm. I want my books to be almost like watching television, but in your mind, without commercials. <laughs> That's exactly what Denise says in the chat, a movie in your head. So, um, okay. Well, I want to say for anybody who has not read Calico yet, because it did just come out today, um, it starts with a bang. That's all I'm going to say. And you will, <laughs> yeah, you will have a hard time putting it down unless you you fall asleep like I did um <laughs> but Paul would like that's to not know. a ringing endorsement I couldn't put it down until three pages in when I nodded off uncontrollably <laughs> I think I was about like 200 pages in okay at three in the morning it's on page 200 that you nodded off <laughs> it was right in the middle of a hot sex scene you fell asleep during that my god it's like you're married to me I'm joking <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> um I'm going to maybe play this right back to my husband later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Paul asks, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your writing process from the first draft through revisions to finished product and about your first success at being published? I know you write two books a year, um, although this you just explained earlier before we started that you have three books coming out within like a six month period. So that's kind of crazy. Well, let's see. My first writing, I have to go back. I told you about my my family and that my first book came out when I was 18. 
the way that first book came about is I had a professor at UCLA, a journalism professor, who wrote these big bulky conspiracy thrillers like Robert Ludlum used to write. And uh, his publisher, and he, we would talk, he would show me his manuscripts and I'd give him advice on writing and sex and foreign locations, even though I didn't know anything about writing. I hadn't had sex. I'd never been anywhere outside of California. I was an expert on everything. And one day his publisher came to him and asked him if he'd write a men's action adventure series. They don't exist now, but they were really big back then. And they're like the male equivalent of the Harlequin romance. They had titles like The Executioner, The Destroyer, The Defender, The the Drooler, The the, it's the Embezzler, all this stuff, The Defecator, <laughs> The the Sneezer. They all had E-R-O-R at the end. And some guy on the cover with a black behind me with a big gun and explosions and women. And, and he said he wasn't hungry enough, desperate enough, or stupid enough to write one of those kinds of books. But he knew somebody who was. <laughs> and he recommended me, all of 18 years old, to write this, these books. So I became Ian Ludlow. So I'd be on the shelf next to Robert Ludlum <laughs> and Ian for Ian Fleming. So people would go, Ian Ludlow. You know, I think I read something by him. It wasn't bad. And Ludlow, so I'd be on the shelf next to Robert Ludlum, who at the time was the biggest selling author on the planet. And his covers were so boring. There were, you know, the Brandenburg Gate and the Supreme Court. And I had boobs. I had explosions. I had, whoop, there it is, big guns. You know, so, well, my book came out um, the same week. And I'll tell you a little story later about Robert Ray Lewis books. But my book came out the same week this guy Bernard Getz blew away some muggers on a New York subway train. My book was about a vigilante. Vigilantes were hot. My book became an overnight bestseller. New World Pictures bought the movie rights, hired me to write the script. And both my publishing and screenwriting careers were born at the same time. As far as my writing process goes. Oh, wait, wait. Was it called yeah. Vigilantor? No, no. It was called 357 Vigilante by oh, Ian Oh, because you said that it all had to end with O-R. Yeah, I wanted to be a little bit different. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell the other story now. I, okay. I I had literary aspirations. I wanted to be the Larry McMurtry of men's action adventure novels. So my hero was this this guy who becomes a vigilante because his dad is killed by a street gang. So at night, my hero, Brett Macklin, picks up a gun and kills bad guys. But then after a day or night of killing bad guys, when he gets into bed with his girlfriend, he can't get it up. Because all he sees are the people he killed. Um, you know, He's so overwhelmed by the death and blood in his life, he just can't make love. And my editor said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> this is a men's action adventure series. Not only is he having sex, he's having amazing sex. <laughs> this really depressed me because, you know, Larry McMurtry wouldn't do this. So I wrote, rewrote the sex scenes and they defied gravity. They defied Ooh. anatomy. They defied common sense. He'd glance at a woman and she'd fall into spasms of orgasm. He'd touch a woman on the arm and she'd pass out and be in a coma because of the orgasms. I had <laughs> positions that couldn't be done. Anyway, I sent this thing in. And a few weeks later, I get a call from my editor. And he says, I've read the news scenes. Now, I know what the next line was going to be. And we're throwing out your contract. You're finished. You know, who the hell do you think you are? But that's not what he said. What he said was, not only were they hot, they were real. Oh, God. If that's what real sex is like, I'm a complete failure. I'm never going to make it. <laughs> you know, but the books were successful. Um, and they, I did four of them. And. As I said, it launched my my career. The movie never got made. I never got a dime out of the books because the publishing company went out of business conveniently right before they owed me my royalties. But it worked out. Uh, and I've had a parallel career ever since, writing for television and writing books. Uh, for 20 years, television was primarily what I was doing. I did. I wrote and produced shows like Sequest, Diagnosis Murder, The Cosby Mysteries, Baywatch, um, <laughs> all kinds of things. But I was writing books at the same time. Like when I was doing Monk, I wrote Monk novels. After Diagnosis Murder was over, I wrote eight Diagnosis Murder books. And uh, and now I, I still divide my career between television and film and, and books. But I think books take up uh, more of my time because, it, frankly, that's just I like the lifestyle now of being a novelist mm -hmm. uh, more than being a, a TV writer. It's it's a whole other world and it's very stressful. And I find uh, being a novelist is a a little easier going. And I'm still involved. I mean, most of my books have been optioned for television, and I'm working with the various producers and the directors who are involved in, in bringing those books to the screen. Okay. And I uh, co-created the series Mystery One-on-One on Hallmark, 
which recently got canceled. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did seven movies, so okay. I can't complain. So it's as far as my writing life, um, I I outline everything I write. I know exactly where I'm going. I don't make it up as I go along. In fact, here is one of my writing binders of research and, and outlines. I typically uh, do my best writing between 8 p.m. and 2 in the morning. Get up around 9 or 10 in the morning, and I, I begin the business of, of writing. I do a lot of interviews. I do things like this. I do marketing. I do uh, proofreading of the previous book. I, I make phone calls. I do all this stuff while rewriting the crap I wrote the night before. And then at 8 p.m., I start writing the new stuff. And I do that until I have a book done. It takes me about five months to write a book. Then I take a month off to relax and also plot the next one. And then I write another book over the next five months. But in between all this, I'm I'm writing scripts and I'm running a publishing company and doing all the other work. And then occasionally I see my family, you know, my mistress, my drug dealer, some strippers, you know, the, the Hollywood lifestyle. Yes, we've talked about that. You had to put all the Coke bowls, bowls away, I've heard. Um, I see one of the questions is, do I... Do I approach a female protagonist differently? And I have to say, um, you know, I, I write a lot of male protagonists, but I, I wrote all the monk novels first person from the point of view of his assistant. And there's strong women characters in my Eve Ronan series and also in, in the books I do with Janet. And my wife, who's French, uh, she says, I know from reading your books that you understand women. So how come you're so stupid around the rest of us? I know from monk, you know how to clean. How come you do not clean anything? I want to be married to the woman you write about in your books. Not that she's gay, but the point of view, the idea is apparently she thinks I'm plugged into women in fiction, but not so much in my day-to-day life. Is this true though? <laughs> so she, she does say uh, to people, if I die before my husband... I went to a complete investigation. I don't care if I'm hit by a meteor or a bus or killed in a tidal wave. It needs to be investigated because he spends all day coming up with perfect murders. <laughs> it's like, she's got a point. Yeah, she's she's not dumb, that's for sure. Um. <laughs> she also doesn't sound like Inspector Cluzo, but I can't do her accent. <laughs> I thought you did pretty well. Um, Rick wants to know, how did you shift from being an author to a producer? It doesn't sound like you did. It sounds like you kind of did them. No, they're, but they're all different hats. I mean, a producer is very different. I mean, I, I was a writing executive producer, but being a producer means you're also involved with budgets and shooting schedules and prep and editing and casting and color correction and, and looping new dialogue and dealing with networks and dealing with studios and hiring uh directors and, and dealing with camera packages and finding sets. And I mean, there's a million things involved with producing that have very little to do with writing. Um, and writing for television is very different than writing books. When you write a television script, you're essentially an architect. You're, you're creating a blueprint for other people to do their best work. The directors, the location scouts, the, the wardrobe people, the actors. I mean, so many other people are bringing their talents to the project and using your script as the basis for their creative contribution. Mm -hmm. So a script is a working document. It's not the same as a a book. A book, I'm all those people. I control everything. I control point of view and no one has to go out and make it in the real world in seven days, three days on your standing sets, four days on location for X amount of dollars. You know, it's a, it's a very different skill set. And I know very few authors who can be TV writer producers and very few TV writer producers who have the skills to be authors. There are some, but not many. They're they're very, very different ways of telling stories, very different ways of working. Mm-hmm. And is there a reason you went towards producing versus like directing or something? Well, I, I think I never had the time to direct. I mean, I was so busy producing the shows, I couldn't take myself away from the, the producing to do directing. I, I think if I have one regret about the time when I was, um, I mean, I'm realistic of where I fit in the TV world now, but you know, 20 years ago when I was a, a very successful writer, producer, and showrunner, I could have given myself episodes of direct. I had that power. And I wish now that maybe I had, because I have directed some short films in the years since then. That's another story. And I found I really enjoyed it. And I regret not doing that. Um, I mean, the only directing I did when I was doing TV shows is sometimes I would direct some uh, second unit and not second unit action, but 
um, we need like a whole bunch of new establishing shots for a community general hospital and diagnosis murder. And I grabbed a camera crew and said, okay, I need this angle. I need this kind of shot. Cause I knew what I was missing in the editing room when I was putting these shows together. And sometimes when a show ran short, I wouldn't um, direct a scene, but I would you know, tell the director what we needed for this new scene to fit into everything else we did. So, I mean, I had clear views about what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And frankly, in television, unlike feature films, the writer is in charge. The writer producer is in charge. It's the director who's visiting. Ooh. And the director hands over their cut to you, the writer producer. And it's I recut probably every episode a director gave to us. So that I just I did it didn't in a way I, I just I feel like I'm directing already by writing it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I see it in my head. So um I'm going to, we, I, I know we do want to talk about the books a bit more too, but I want, I'm getting several questions about Monk. And the first, first one is uh, something you had mentioned to me again, before we started was uh, Cindy says, how did you come to create him? <laughs> I, I did not create Monk. Monk was created by the brilliant and very funny Andy Breckman. And I'm very lucky that he let me play in his sandbox. He hired me to write episodes of the show. And then when he was approached about books, he said, I don't want to write the books, but if Lee Goldberg wants to, then I'm all for it. And so I wrote 15 original Monk novels, three of which or four, I've forgotten after all these years, became episodes. And uh, we got some nasty emails and letters from readers who'd say, oh, that hack Lee Goldberg ripped off the famous episode, Mr. Monk can't see a thing. And we had to actually put a disclaimer in the book saying, no, 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 the, the book came first. It's called Mr. Monk Goes to the Firehouse and Lee Goldberg wrote that too. And that happened a couple of times. Um, Mr. Monk and the Blue Flu became an episode called Mr. Monk and the Badge. So we had to you know, let readers know that, no, I wasn't ripping off the TV show. And the TV show wasn't ripping off me. They had every right to use. Um, and there, there are times they use scenes from my books in other episodes that weren't based on my books. But the studio and the show owned the content of my books and could use them any way they wanted. Uh, but I, I had a wonderful time. And, and I think... After 15 books, I said everything I had to say about Adrian Monk. After 15 books and four episodes. And I, I wanted to move on to characters that uh, I created. Mm -hmm. And you are not involved in the upcoming movie. Not at all. I'm looking for, I mean, I know a lot about it, obviously, but I'm looking forward to seeing it just like everybody else. So um, Maria has a question that I think a lot of us do have. What is it like to be in a writer's room for any TV show? It's... It's something I miss being a novelist because this is my writer's room. It's just it's just me. One of the great things about a writer's room is you are in a room with six, seven, ten other really creative writers. And you're all working towards the same goal, telling the best possible story, creating the best possible episode of the show that you can. Mm -hmm. And what's great is you have all these different points of view, all these different skill sets. Now, you need a captain. You need a showrunner who says, here's what we're doing. And it can say what direction we're going and what ideas are good, what ideas are bad, and to steer the creation. But it also forces you to be at the top of your game. But when you're not at the top of your game, that's fine. Because if you can't get the story where it needs to go or get a scene where it needs to go, there's someone else in the room who can. Mm -hmm. or, or there's something you're trying to articulate or achieve and can't quite get it. There's someone else who can see it and knows how to do it, which is which is great. And people have different skills. I mean, in a writer's room, you cast it much like the actors on a TV show. You cast for different strengths. There might be a writer who's great at dialogue, sucks at plot. You might have a, a person who's great at plot, but not very good at dialogue. Um, you may have a person whose real skill is rewrite. You may have a person who's, whose best skill is keeping a room going. He, he or she has great ideas and maybe their scripts are mediocre, but that's okay because they're so valuable in the room with their generating ideas. You know, it's, um, and, and maybe one, one, um, writer has a real knack for the procedural aspect of a story or another one has a real knack for the you know, banter dialogue you know, or whatever. You, you, you cast a room so you have all the strengths you need to overcome any individual weaknesses a writer might have. Mm -hmm. But it also is a problem because then you don't have a single authorial voice. I mean, the showrunner will always take a pass through the scripts and make it his or her own because ultimately they're in charge. And your job as a writer's room is to tell stories the way they tell stories to tell stories in the voice of the showrunner. Um, the great thing about the book is, and also in a, in a writer's room, in a TV show, you're writing for a shooting schedule. You're writing for a budget. You're writing for a cast. What you come up with has to be shot in the real world with real people 
for a certain amount of money over a certain amount of days. And that's not easy. With a book, I'm freed of all that. Uh, I don't have to deal with agents. I don't have to deal with actors. I don't have to deal with directors. I don't have to deal with rain ruining an outdoor shoot. I don't have to deal with any of that. I can do whatever I want. But also means I don't have the crutch of a writer's room. I don't have, it's lonely. I mean, where are the writers in here? Are going to be helping me out? I mean, usually there's a dog on the couch. They're passing gas, but that doesn't really help me write <laughs> my books. Um, so I do miss that aspect of television. I miss the collegial aspect of of the writer's room. Uh, and I miss, uh, like, I, on Diagnosis Murder, for instance, if I was having a hard time getting into a scene or a character, I could go down to the set and literally be in that character's world. I can be in his home, be in his office, sit in his chair. I could, I could go to the police precinct I'm writing about. I could, I could actually be in the imaginary world itself. Mm -hmm. And that was e extremely inspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, so that... I miss that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't miss the hours. I don't miss the aggravation. I don't miss the network notes. I don't miss the studio notes. I don't miss a lot of that. I, I miss. I, I don't miss having the control. And I. I mean, I, I. I. I like that. I have to only listen to one voice, my own, when I write mm -hmm. the books. So, <laughs> two questions then. Who was your favorite actor that you met? That I met or that I worked with. That you've worked with. Oh, that's difficult. Um, I would have to, you know, I guess in, it would, in some ways it'd be Dick Van Dyke because Dick and I didn't always agree, but he was always straightforward with me. He would tell me if he had a problem. And even though he was a television legend, still is a television legend, he always respected my authority that I was in charge of the show. And never, if he wanted to undermine me, like he didn't like some things I was doing and said, you know, I'm going to go to the network and tell them I really don't like what you're doing here. And I said, that's fine. I, I work for the network. If they want me to go back to what we were doing before, I'll do it. But as far as I know, this is what they want me to do. And he went to the head of the network to complain about some things. Then the head of the network said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> the show was ranked 60th before. We're in the top 14. We're getting reviewed. Why would we go back to the way it was before? And so Dick came back and said, I'm not going to argue with you about that stuff anymore. And he didn't. You know, so... I always knew that that with, if Dick said something, um, he was a man of his word and and he meant it. He 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 would tell me what he was feeling. I worked with a lot of other authors who authors, excuse me, actors who were duplicitous and would lie to my face and try to undermine me in so many other ways. Uh, Robert Urich was great to work with. He oh. was terrific. I, I didn't run Specs yeah. of Fire. I just uh, worked on a few episodes, but my interactions with him were very good. My interactions with Timothy Hutton on Nero Wolf were great. So go back to what you uh, you said, um, somebody I work with or somebody I've met. Who's your favorite actor that you've met? Oh, that I've met? Um, well, I don't know if, if you're aware, but before I uh, became an author, I put myself through school, put myself through college as a reporter for American film, Starlog, uh, yeah. United Press International, the LA Times Syndicate, and I specialized in writing about television and film. So I got to interview all of my favorite actors. I interviewed everybody who ever played James Bond. I interviewed James Garner, Tom Cruise, Roy Scheider. Um, I interviewed just so many wonderful people, but I was really surprised by how down to earth and friendly and warm uh, Roger Moore and James Garner were they and coincidentally they worked on the same show at one time they both were on Maverick back in the 50s not together but uh, Roger Moore replaced James Garner when James Garner walked off but they were really sweet wonderful people who didn't have any of that that star thing going on mm -hmm. um, and that that they were really nice really nice and so you did all that before you turned 18 uh, no 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 I, I <laughs> put myself through college Actually, I started in high school interviewing actors and stuff over the phone. I was able to use my dad's voice. They didn't know I was 16. And I put myself through college writing about the entertainment industry. And then we're getting granular now, but I had those books that came out when I was in college. The publisher went out of business. The movie didn't get made. And I figured I had my shot. Didn't happen. And for the next year or so, I lived as a reporter covering the entertainment industry, thinking okay. that was going to be my life. And a, a spec episode of Spencer for Hire I wrote 
got picked up and shot by Spencer for Hire, and that launched my my TV career. Wow. Um, so I should mention, I keep saying I, I, I when talking about my television uh, work. I was I wrote for 20, actually more than 20 years with William Rabkin. He and I were writing, producing mm -hmm. partners. So when I'm saying I, I, I about diagnosis, murder and martial law and Spencer and all these series, I did them all with Bill. We were a writing team and we had a wonderful time. In fact, he and I wrote the screenplay for 357 Vigilante together. We met in college. So I don't want people to think that I'm taking all the credit for the work that Bill and I did together. Bill and I wrote and produced probably a thousand hours of television together and had a, a wonderful time doing it. So I need to make that caveat. Um, mm -hmm. No, somebody asked that in the, in the Q and a. Um, oh, good. It was probably Bill. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Haven't forgotten you. <laughs> um, the last question about TV for right now is, um, were you affected by the writer strike and now the actor strike? Oh, of course. Of course. I had a bunch of projects going on the ground to a stop because of the writer's guild strike and the actor's strike, which is still going on, the actor's strike. And I was on the picket line a lot uh, during the writer's guild strike. I, you know, Several times a week, I was out there walking in the picket line. And it, it has a huge impact on me from in terms of my health care, my family's health care, residuals. Um, and I have a family that works in the entertainment industry. My brother-in-law is a grip. And he's been out of work for well over six months because of the shutdown in Hollywood. A grip is someone who you know moves the lights around and the, lays the track for the cameras and moves the sets around and and you know does the physical work of of uh, movie production. So he's you know he's been struggling. Uh, I have lots of friends who you know do hair and makeup and uh, I know directors. I, I mean I have so many friends in every aspect of the industry and they've been horribly affected by this strike. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate that I have an income as a writer because I didn't suffer severe financial uh, problems because of the strike, like so many of my friends. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what they were hoping for, right? Um, anyways, not to get into it, not to get into it. Um, so let's move on to uh, lots of questions about uh, working with Janet Ivanovich. You and I had spoken a little bit before too about the voice. How did you come up with how you were gonna, who was gonna do what when? in those stories, because they're, again, seamless, just amazingly wonderful books. The first thing you have to understand is Janet and I were friends long before we started writing together. Ooh. So I wasn't intimidated by Janet Ivanovich because I knew her when she was just Janet. Yeah. In fact, honestly, we don't remember how and when we first met. We <laughs> think it had to have been around the time of our first Stephanie Plum book. Really? But we've been friends for forever. And, um, she was having some problems with another co-author she was working with on another series. And she was in LA for some meeting. Whenever she comes to LA, we get together for like a four hour dinner at some very fancy restaurant and drink a lot of wine and, you know, catch up. And um, so you know, this happened, she was in town and we were talking about collaborations and she was really curious how I work with other writers, how a writer's room works. How do you do this? Because she had a very hard time with collaborators. And then we just started talking about, the kinds of movies and TV shows that we love that weren't being done anymore, like Remington Steel and It Takes a Thief, and the Thomas Crown Affair and Maverick and The Saint and the the Avengers of Patrick McNee and you know mm -hmm. uh, uh, Diana Rigg and you know, those kinds of things. And then we had one of those comfortable silences that old friends can have at dinner. And she said, "We ought to write that." I said, "That the the book that we wish someone would do. We should do that." I said, "Yeah, mm -hmm. we should." And I thought she meant each of us individually. And then she said, how come we've never written a book together? And I said, you've never asked. She <laughs> said, well, why don't we write this? And we started talking. And, and then I went back home and I wrote up an email summarizing what we talked about. But I put at the end, if you wake up in the morning and you realize, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, when you sober up, it's OK. You know, don't worry about it. But no, she loved it. And 24 hours later, we had this incredible book deal with Random House. And one of the things that I said to her was, I'm not Janet Ivanovich. If I could write like you, I would be writing like you, and I'd be an international best-selling author. And if I try to write like you, you're just going to be disappointed because it's not going to measure up. If we're going to do this together, we have to create a voice that's neither Janet Ivanovich or Lee Goldberg. It has to be Jan Leovich. It has to be something we're both comfortable writing, but it's not identifiable as either you or me. And we need a book that is not a Stephanie Plum clone. Mm -hmm. 
It should appeal to Stephanie Plum readers, but also their husbands and boyfriends. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 do the and let's make sure that our heroine is not Stephanie Plum. She's the opposite. She kills people. She's <laughs> she's Ranger. You know she's, and so we we work together and all this stuff. And the way it worked is I would go to Janet and say, "Here's my idea for the book," and she would tell me her thoughts. And then I'd write up a very short pitch, and she'd give me her thoughts. And then I'd write sort of a step outline. And she'd give me her thoughts. And then I would write 25,000 word chunks that I would send to Janet. And she would send them back to me with her notes, which I would then incorporate and move on and then send her another 25,000 word chunk until 100,000 words were written. And then she'd go over the book and sprinkle her magic Janet dust on it. And I'm not saying that facetiously. It's magic Janet dust. I mean, <laughs> I would think I was writing, you know, super lean to the bone and she would take two pages of my crap and just leave one line that I wrote. And I realized, God, she was right. That one line said it all. I didn't need the rest. And, and it just, what, it, what we have found funny is the critics or readers will, will point to something and say, oh, this line here is clearly Janet and it's me. Well, so oh, here's Lee Goldberg, obviously, and it's Janet. Or there'll be situations where we can't remember who wrote mm -hmm. what. Um, but it was, we had great fun. We, we really just wrote to amuse each other. We enjoyed going on the press tours together. Um, we wrote the books because they were books we weren't seeing that we wanted to read ourselves. And I, I did five books with her. It was a wonderful, great experience. I learned so much from her and I'd probably still be doing them today, but there were other books I wanted to write. And I felt that after five books, I had done everything. I mean, I, would, I could obviously have done 10, 20 more, but there are other stories I wanted to tell, mm -hmm. other things I wanted to do. And um, so it was a totally amicable party. It wasn't like we had any sort of fight or anything. And I went off and did, you know, Lost Hills and True Fiction and and all these other books that would never have happened if it wasn't for me leaving that Fox and O'Hare relationship. And I'm glad I did because um, the books have just done that I've done with Jan after Janet have done so well, and I would have missed out on all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I got to have my cake and eat it too. I got to have the experience of writing with Janet and learning so much from her and just having the pleasure of those books and then to, to have my own uh, career outside of Janet. And and there's a business side of it too, which is I've decided I'm not going to write ever again um, somebody else's character. And, and by that, I mean, I'm not going to write Monk. I'm not going to write Diagnosis Murder. I'm not going to write an NCIS. I'm not going to co-author with anybody. I'm just going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I just don't, I just don't see that as something that's beneficial to my creative artistic future. Mm -hmm. It would be easier if I did. I mean, having someone else in the room, you know, having Janet in here to, to edit. And I mean, and I loved hanging out with her in Florida and we had so much fun, but uh, it's, it's, it can be seductive and, and I can get away from me doing the hard work of coming up with these novels on my own. Um, you know, I'm a procrastinator and I'll take the easy way any way I can. Oh God. I tip with Janet. Great. That's half the, the job is taken by somebody else who really knows what she's doing. It's hard to believe given that you, what, this is your 40th book. I've lost track to tell you the truth. Uh, um, yeah. I think that's what I saw in your bio, but um, yeah, I mean, you've just done so much, but the only question I have in terms of your collaboration with Janet was in terms of voice was the, you guys have such amazing and different humor, you know? Um, well, that's the other thing. The humor had to be Leo Vanovich humor as well. Right. It couldn't be distinctly Janet. It couldn't be distinctly Lee. It's almost like doing a TV show. When you do a TV show, you're hiring writers to convey the voice of the showrunner. So in essence, Janet and I created a fictional showrunner and we were mimicking his or her voice. So that way, either Janet or I could step in and write a scene or write dialogue. And it wasn't obvious that either one of us had done it. It was one consistent voice. There was neither Lee nor Janet and the humor was not Janet humor or, or Lee humor. It was a distinctive voice. And I haven't read the Fox and O'Hare books that, that followed the five I did, but I, I've heard because people come up to me at conferences and book signings and tell me it's not the same because it's not me and Janet. We had an alchemy together. And I don't think anyone else who comes in now is going to have to try to imitate the voice that Janet and I created for each other. And I just don't think that's possible. I think the last person who came in used his own voice and and it was a good voice but not the fox and hair voice from what i've heard i mm -hmm. haven't read the books um 
So that, that's so it's very. We we thought long and hard about how to approach these collaborations so they wouldn't feel um, like imitation of Janet or imitation of Lee, and you wouldn't see the any patchwork. Mm -hmm. It was a, and I think that is why the books did so well, and why some other collaborations don't do as well. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, those were very successful to me. I loved reading them. Um, Carolyn Seifer went to high school with you, class of 1980, asked if there was any um, teachers at Northgate who inspired you. Yes, there were. It's not going to mean anything to anyone but her. But <laughs> I had a, a teacher named Paul Dalmas, who was my creative writing or English instructor. Mm -hmm. And he, he saw my interests and my skills. And he said, I'm going to give the class all these other assignments, but I want you just to write short stories and give them to me and I will grade you on. I want you to participate in class with, with the books we're reading and everything, but uh, you have a, a real skill as a storyteller and let's work on that. And so I would give him stories and we'd meet at lunchtime or recess or after school and he would give me notes and he gave me enormous freedom to, and I ended up writing, running a, I haven't thought about this in ages. We had a literary magazine at the high school that I edited and started as a result of that. I, I think, what was it called? I think it was called, Creations Monthly or something like that. Um, but I also worked on the school newspaper. And uh, uh, the advisor on the school newspaper was also really, really supportive. Um, and I even went back years later when I had my novels out. And I spent a full day at the school talking to all the English classes and saying that you think that what you do here doesn't matter. And I'm here to tell you that it does. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have written my first novel at 18. The age I was when I graduated from High school, if not for what I learned in this, everything I learned in high school under these teachers is helping me today. Mm -hmm. So let me go back a little bit further even and ask if you were a reader when you were a kid or more of a TV watcher. I was both. I was a big reader and it got me into trouble. I remember uh, one time I was, I lived in Walnut Creek and there was a B. Dalton downtown and I went down there and I bought, I think it was The Godfather, The Rope Dancer, a Harold Robbins novel. I can't remember what they were. And the bookseller refused to sell them to me. And my mother heard about it. Were you like five? She drove down to the Barnes and Noble. And she said, you can sell my son any book in this store he wants to read. Any book. He said, even The Joy of Sex. And my mom said, he doesn't need to buy it. We've got two copies at home. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was a fierce defender of that. I was reading. I mean, when, when my classmates in sixth grade were reading Hardy Boys, whatever, I, I was reading, you know, uh, Raymond Chandler and and Robert Ludlow. I was reading all these you know, popular novels. In fact, teachers would ask me, "What do you think of this book?" I was thinking of reading it. You know, it, it was. <laughs> I was always a a reader, but also was a voracious television watcher. Um, I was I was told by my mailman that I was the only person in the San Francisco East Bay who had a subscription to Weekly Variety, which is the trade <laughs> publication of the entertainment industry at the time. And I was writing articles for. Um, uh, the United Press International and other newspapers about television while I was in high school, they just didn't know I was a high school student. <laughs> so I was, I was very much into, into all of it then. In fact, I started writing a book when I was in, in high school called Unsold Television Pilots, Every Idea Rejected by the Network Since the Dawn of Television. And I got academic credit for it while I was in college, course credit for the book. And then the book came out, I mean, I'm trying to remember if I was still a teenager or if I was a 20 or whatever but it was a huge success johnny carson talked about it on the tonight show it became the basis of two tv specials one on cbs and one on abc so i've been i've been doing this my entire life as long as i can remember i've been writing stories mm -hmm. amazing i have to ask the walnut creek ingles <laughs> has nothing to do with laura ingles wilder <laughs> just checking <laughs> Okay. Oh, I read all those books, of course. And that was Walnut Grove, I believe, not Walnut Creek. Oh. Yeah, anything Walnut in the Midwest, you know, that we just that's just where we go. Um, Sharon wants to know, how did you get Randy Newman to write the wonderful theme song for Monk? By not getting Randy Newman to write the wonderful theme song. I didn't create the show or have anything to do with that. <laughs> well, how does how does one get somebody like Randy Newman to do a theme song for their show? I, it's simple. I can I can answer it from the point of view of having hired composers for all my other TV shows, you call them up and you yeah. say, Hey, I got a TV series. I think you're really good. I'd love you to score our show or write an original theme for our show. I'm into your music. I mean, the fact is when you start doing a show, 
you get inundated with uh, demo tapes from composers mm -hmm. and singers and songwriters because they know how much money there is to be made from a song. Because not only do you get all the royalties every week from the show, but also in reruns. But if a hit single comes off that that show, it's it's a cash machine. I mean, Henry Mancini made so much money from the Peter Gunn theme. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it sounds strange, but I think Jerry Goldsmith's most successful theme was for Barnaby Jones, because that show ran for nine years. He got money every single you know week for nine years, and then in reruns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still on MeTV. Um, so what shows did you have where you had like that kind of creative control for the music, the, the ones that you produced, right? Yeah, I mean, many shows. I mean, uh, Diagnosis, Murder, Martial Law, Cosby Mysteries, 1-800-MISSING, uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff. Oh. Um, so the question I have about Monk is a little bit different. Um, he obviously, the character obviously had maybe OCD or, you know, something like that, that made him, um, d people see him in a different way. Did you get any pushback or, or like thanks for like sort of writing about a character who used something that was difficult for him to really um, solve mysteries? Yes. I mean, I, I got, I never saw pushback, but I got lots of thanks. So many people came up to me and thanked me uh, mm -hmm. for making OCD something that was humanized and not strange. But again, I didn't create the show. The credit for this goes to Andy Breckman. But I I, I got so many people who've said to me, uh, my, my mom was dying and um, I would read your books and they would take me away from that pain. Or I was in chemotherapy and I'd read your books and they'd get me through it. Or uh, so many people who said that the humor and humanity of the Monk books gave them some peace. And I don't think I can get a higher compliment than, than that. So I, I appreciate that you brought up the creator, but I think that the writing of those shows was so, um, so humane, as you say, that um, people really uh, connected with Monk in a way they might not have otherwise. That was Andy. As I mentioned earlier, every script goes through the showrunner's typewriter. Mm. And Andy Breckman rewrote every single script on Monk. Every okay. single one. He told his writers, if you can get a script 40% of the way there, I'm delighted. Because I just got to do a rewrite for a day on dialogue. And and he was deeply involved in all the plotting. He had nothing to do with my 15 books. I wrote those books entirely on my own. He didn't even need to see a outline. He would just call me after he read them and say how much he, he liked them. And in fact, I remember when the first book came out, he said, this would make a great episode of the show. I said, because it's already written. And he said, exactly. <laughs> and then it was called Mr. Monk Goes to the Firehouse. So then shortly, the, the, here's the interesting thing about Monk. It was set in San Francisco. It was shot in Los Angeles, and all the writer producers were in um, New Jersey. I forgot huh. the name of the town in New Jersey, but it's where Andy lived. And he didn't want to leave that town, so it was all in in New Jersey. And if you worked on an episode of Monk, you had to fly out to New Jersey for a week or two, and it was not pleasant. So when he said he wanted to you know, do a, a script based on my book, I, and he wanted me to write it, I said, great. Do I still have to come out to New Jersey? And he said, yes. Yeah. So a day or so before I was packing to go, he said, Lee, everyone on the staff's read the book. We just have a few minor tweaks we want to make. Minor stuff. It'll, you know, it'll write itself. I said, what kind of minor tweaks? He said, what if Mr. Monk is blind? And I laughed. I thought, Andy, oh. you're, just, you're so funny. So what are the minor tweaks? He said, that's it. So that's not a minor tweak, Andy. Why not? Because he's blind. Well, that doesn't change anything. It changes everything. How does it change everything? Because he's blind. He can't see anything. He can't see all the clues. It completely changes everything. It's not a minor tweak. It's completely different. Lee, Lee, calm down. It's not that big a deal. It's all the same except he's blind. It can't be the same. Why? Because he's blind. Well, sure enough, the book's called Mr. Monk Goes to the Firehouse, but the episode is called Mr. Monk Can't See a Thing because he's blind. <laughs> but it was a great episode. Bill and I had a wonderful time writing it. Um, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a blast. <laughs> um, okay. So I know everybody in this chat loves Monk and loves the Janet Vanovich books and, and, and your, uh, Thomas and Mercer books, which is Malibu burning, right? So is there any chances this series, this, this, um, Thomas and Mercy Mercer will become a TV show? A TV show? Um, 
I wonder how much I can say. Any of your books, anything happening. Oh, all my books have been optioned for television or film for the most part. I think there are only a couple that are still available. But Malibu Burning, we're just probably, it could happen after this phone call, just a short time away from closing the deal. We've been negotiating since the writer strike ended. Um, Whether it'll become a TV series or not, I can't tell you. I mean, my, my book, True Fiction, has been in development at ABC forever and nothing's happened with it. Eve Ronan was in development for a while. Um, but there will be more books featuring, when you say Thomas and Mercer, that's the publishing company. The oh, characters in the book are Sharp and Walker. And the second Sharp and Walker book is already written, comes out in September of 2024. It's called Ashes Never Lie. And the third book is sitting here yet to be realized. It's just the research and stuff for it. Um, it'll come out in the spring of 2025. And uh, whether it becomes a TV series is, I have no idea. But I've been very fortunate that all of my books have had um, a lot of interest from television and film, but so far none have, have made the jump. So Malibu Burning, I'm really curious about this because um, your own family had to to uh, leave from the fires, the, the your own home burned down. So how much of that um, informed this book, your experience? A lot. Yeah. Um, actually, this book takes place uh, at the same time as over my shoulder, oh, this way. The book <laughs> behind me, Lost Hills. Um, the ending of Lost Hills is this giant fire in the Santa Monica Mountains that was fictional. I wrote this fictional fire. And about the same time I got the galleys, a real fire broke out here. And was the flames were licking the back of my yard, and I had to evacuate. And I took my galleys with me. And I remember sitting at my, my sister's house out in Valencia, editing the scenes about the fire and seeing them on the news. Well, you know, that description was accurate. <laughs> it's happening just the way I imagined. I, you know, I had to put a disclaimer in my book saying, I didn't copy the 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 fire. It, it happened after I wrote my book. Mm-hmm. It just was coincidental. And then um, I had this idea for a, a major heist during the middle of a massive wildfire. And I thought, I can't really do that because I've already done it. And I decided to lean into it. I've already done it. I'll make it the same fire from a different point of view. And people who read Malibu Burning will read Lost Hills with a whole different perspective and vice versa. And, and, and that'll work out. And uh, and I also wanted to write a different kind of police procedural. It didn't have homicide detectives in it. Mm-hmm. And frankly, I wanted to have some of the fun I had in those Janet Ivanovich co-authored books. I wanted another big, over-the-top, inventive heist Um and so that's what I did. I, I told a dual storyline about uh, a really clever crook pulling off this at, incredibly audacious heist while he's being pursued by these relentless arson investigators. And I wanted my readers rooting for both. Mm. And uh, I've been very fortunate that the book was a success before it even came out. The pre-orders were so strong that the publisher ordered a sequel. So I delivered the sequel I think the same day or a few days before Malibu Burning came out. So it was available for pre-order when people bought uh, Malibu Burning. Mm-hmm. But I've been so thrilled by the success of that book. It's mm-hmm. really taken me by surprise. Was it, um, having gone through that, I mean, it, it sounds like it was a fun book to write, but also was it at all cathartic for you because you've been through this traumatic thing? It wasn't that traumatic for me because the fire came out to my fence. I didn't have to fight it. You know, I haven't been in the flames myself, so uh, I didn't have to deal with the trauma of okay. being in a fire or losing my home to a fire. Um, I know people who did. My sister's neighbors had their homes burned down and it, and and friends of mine in this community. So I'm, I'm well aware of the pain um, and suffering those fires caused. But what I was I'm writing is entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's not the, the harrowing emotional loss of a, of a major fire. So I didn't have to mine any of my own inner turmoil. I just had to have fun. <laughs> That's fine. I just, I, when I read that, that you had, you know, the burning of your, you know, in your own neighborhood, I thought, oh, that must've been really difficult. So I'm glad that we, we got to talk about that. <laughs> so um, what is up next for you? You said that the third, no, the next, the next, this book, the next book of this is coming out in. What's next for me. I don't have it right. I should have had it right here as a prop, but uh, Malibu burning came out in September. Right. Calico came out today. Today. Here it is. We spent a lot of time talking about Monk, but this is what I want you to run out and buy. Calico. Um, that came out today. 
and I'm going on a press a book tour for that and starting tomorrow. And I have another novel coming out in January called Dreamtown, and it's the fifth Eve Ronan novel. Oh. Uh, the start of the series that started with Lost Hills over my <laughs> shoulder there. And uh, in fact, the second Sharp and Walker novel, the sequel to Malibu Burning, that's coming out in September of 2024, is a crossover with the Eve Ronan series. It doubles as Eve Ronan number six. So mm -hmm. I have two series in one book. Wow. And is there anything that you haven't written that you're that you want to? Because you said that Calico was a little bit of a turn for you. And you actually made it happen because the publisher didn't want to do it. So what else is out there for you? I want to go back in a way and write a true whodunit, you know, in the in the sense of of Monk and Hercule Poirot and Columbo. I want to write uh, a quirky whodunit that, that's fairly clued. And I have an idea for one and my publisher has bought it. But um, the success of Malibu Burning kind of took us all by surprise. So it might not be till late 2025 before I get around to writing that book. Okay. And, but you, <laughs> you do write two books a year. So yes. you're, you said that one's coming out. Two, I have one I've already finished. It's coming out in September of 2024. Yep. I'm about to start writing the book that comes out in September or excuse me, uh, spring of 2025. And then once I turn that one in, I'll start working on the book. They'll come out either at the end of 2025 or the beginning of 2026. Okay. It takes about 12 months between when I deliver a book and when it uh, goes into print. And you have that's all of, and from a business side, that's part of my calculus. I have to think about about cash flow. You mm -hmm. know, I'm I'm looking ahead of when am I going to be living on in in two years or a year. You know? And if I have a book that tanks, I want to have a second book out right away. Mm -hmm. Not that I've had a book that tanked, but just in case, you know, we we all have that possibility. Of course, yeah. And but this uh, book's not going to tank because you're all going to run out and buy three copies for your family and three copies for strangers on the street. <laughs> that's right and you know as much as i love libraries i also think signed books are gold so you should definitely get a signed book from aesop's fables <laughs> i look forward to signing them for you <laughs> i think you did you say you were going to personalize them i think we had that conversation i, I believe I, I don't know how they're handling it i don't know whether the books are coming to me and i'm signing them and and then they're going off to aesop's fables or whether they're having me do uh book plates i haven't heard i know in the past in situations like this the publisher will send me the books. I'll sign them and send them on, but I have no idea. Um, okay. We'll see well, what happens. They will definitely be signed. That's the important thing. One way or the other, either yeah. book plates <laughs> or uh, actual signed copies. That's right. But the point is, is that, you know, this is all good. This is all good food. Like we want to eat it. We want to consume it. We want to read it because there's, it's, um, you know, you, you are just an amazing writer and that does keep us entertained and takes us away from all of our worries. So I really appreciate that. Um, well, if there are any questions, so I've, I've not been able to read the the um, the chat, but if there are any questions you wanted to ask that weren't asked, you can always find me on Facebook at Lee Goldberg or LeeGoldberg.com, and I'll be glad to answer the, your questions there. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, this uh, program that will <laughs> that will just never end for you. <laughs> but thank you so much for spending your hour with us. I know that you've had a... <clears throat> Bit I apologize voice. for my voice if it came in and out or cracked. I've been having some issues with my vocal cords lately. Nope, it was completely fine. So um, yes, anybody who still has questions, just send them to Lee from his, uh, his Facebook page or on his website. Thank you so much again. And um, good luck with uh, your book tour, which starts on Thursday. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> it's definitely mine. I've been so looking forward to this. Have a wonderful night. And Thank <laughs> everybody, you. thanks for joining us.